see, I'm trying to, you know, establish some dress specifics, so I don't know, I'm just kidding. You get tired of looking like Bill Belichick coming to class, you know? And don't get me wrong, I love my hoodies, but no, I was a, I had a meeting over in Topeka earlier today, so I was sort of out of sorts uh, from all of that. So, what's new, folks? Oh, this weather stinks, huh? Yeah, no kidding. But then again, I keep thinking, you know, as a we're like the only place in the planet that's like this cold right now. Right? What's that? No? Ukraine. Ukraine. Okay, so thankfully, thankfully, there's at least not just us. But uh, I think, like, you know, it's probably good that we have some of this, given all the, the warmth that's sort of been generated. Maybe, you know, I used to think, again, I'm from Sacramento. I'm a Northern California. I never saw snow fall when I was there 21 years, right? And, like, in front of me. Or mountains, but I, I was like, you know, you could go visit the snow, but then you come back down and you're out of it, right? And then, uh, uh, like, now I'm like, so before, up until up until this year, I was kind of, God, I was just get so angry when it would get cold. Like, I, I don't deal with this. I'm Californian, right? Didn't I say this already? I'm a Californian. No, we don't do this, right? And then, like, now I'm finally like, well, yeah, I'm probably going to live in Kansas a while. It's okay. I think I can make it. So I'm going to have a new attitude. But yeah, this sucks. <laughs> um, okay. So um, this, this week, planned for everything. Uh, we have a homework. It's out. It's due next week. Anyone look at that yet? Yeah. yeah? Is that good or bad? No, shaking your head. Don't want to say it. That must, that does not, the, the, uh, the feedback I'm getting is uh, so far negative. <laughs> Let me tell you, um, so yesterday I recorded the lecture on mixed models. And there's a reason why it comes second, because that is really painful. So, let, so if there's anything I can tell you right now that this is going to be better once I get, help you get through a little bit of this, I promise you you'll like this way better now, but then like the next home homework is going to be worse. That doesn't help much, does it? But it's the same questions. It's the same data, the same questions, all of that, but it's trying to get you to understand things a little bit differently. But on that note, let's, let's see if I can help a little bit today. Um, first off, let's talk, we had a quiz that was out, right? Should we talk about that? How'd that go? Okay. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm allowing you multiple attempts now before class. Just, I don't think it matters. I was trying to motivate you to watch the videos. I don't know if you watch the video. Do you watch the video? Be honest with me, yeah? I've heard people say that's a good part of the class. Is that? Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to be like looking over your shoulder on this stuff. So that's the weird, the weird thing about instructing a class like this is I don't have the proprioceptive feedback that you're paying attention that I have right, right here. Even though, again, we're all online. I don't care that you're on your laptops. You could only be paying half attention anyway. If I were you, I would be way worse than any of you at that because I, 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 was, I was known as the paper reader in many of my classes. Back when we had news, like the student newspaper used to be like paper, you know. Anyway, I was pretty terrible. Um, so I'm not, try not to like preach or judge. So let's talk about this quiz. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Ah, yes. And as of like, uh, should be right now. Why is it not available? Well, as soon, I, I tried to make it so the next quiz is actually going to be up and available soon. But let's talk about these items. According to Templin, what differentiates path analysis from multivariate linear models? You can't see this? Son of a gun. You should look up. Ha! Better? Thank you. You wouldn't believe, I had, the, I had all the answers to your homeworks up here before just a second ago, too. <laughs> Actually, everybody watching on YouTube will not have seen that. Sorry, YouTube. There's more in-class technical difficulties. Um, what, dif what differentiates path analysis from multivariate linear models? Uh, I like to say outcomes can be predictors. That's where I'm making the distinction in this class. Really, in the world of statistics, 
a multivariate linear model is a path analysis. Like you sort of path analysis subsumes all of it, a lot of it. Like a regression is a path analysis. When you think about it, sort of that hierarchy of things. But I'm trying to make that, that's why I made this according to Templin for this class. I was trying to separate that out because when you start having outcomes that can also be predictors, then you introduce the indirect effects. Everybody loves indirect effects. That's the next question. I did like this. Path analysis is for losers. <laughs> I could just hear our president saying that. That's why I figured that not many people would pick it. So, anyone pick that just for fun? I was really tempted. Because you could take it over again. <laughs> it's like, yes, that one. Magic and that. So, how do you calculate an indirect effect? Does anyone remember? Multiply the slopes of the regression along the way. That's right. Very good. So I didn't talk about this last week, but you could, in theory, have an indirect effect between a uh, one predictor leading to one outcome, and that outcome predicts another outcome, and that outcome predicts the third. There can be an indirect effect that goes through all three of those, right? Because and the way you calculate it's the same, the multiplication of each of those direct effects. Cool, right? Yeah, Alan. So the longer the chain, the smaller the effect. It's possible. It depends. Um, it certainly ups the chance. If any of those are zero, then the whole thing has to be zero. Or if, if any of those are. Less than one. Pardon me. If it's all, they're always between zero and one. Right? Then that would be the case. They're not. Those. They're not. They're not. I mean, the direct. If we calculate them from an unstandardized point of view, they're not always between zero and one. They're always in units of y per units of x. Always just regression slopes. So that depends on what the units of the outcome are. If you're talking about standardized units, then yes, those are always less than one. And so in theory, yes, you could have the, sm the longer the chain, the smaller the indirect. But that should probably make sense pragmatically. Anyone pick magic? That's good. We're done with the days of magic, right? <laughs> no, magic is how you get published. Sorry. <laughs> Sort of how, how you have the great, I, one of the skills I lack is that, I don't know what you would call it, maybe we call it emotional intelligence now, where you're just able to put up with that BS and just kind of keep persevering. I just, you know, without doing anything that takes you farther from your end goals, I'm learning how to have that, but anyway. Um, so, cool. Um, the other thing I was going to mention about path analysis, actually, no, I think I mentioned that. I'm good. Questions about path analysis at all? Nah. Questions about multivariate regression? Should we get into homework? Okay. You see, I can. I, I have my password saved. So many times I go here. Um, where do you want to begin? Just said a. I actually have a question. Oh, path analysis, yes. Um, so, when you were doing all the different models. Yes, it's model crazy, huh? <laughs> and you were comparing the two. Um, I'm wondering how close do they have to be in order for it to be a good effect? How close two variables would have to be? fit, sorry. So, you have ah. to let me go to my slides real quick. Uh, yeah, I sort of I sort of went overboard. Yeah, I really went overboard on that just to kind of give a demonstration of where fit, where good and bad happens to be. But let me walk you through those a little bit. Mainly because it is hard to tell, and I will say that there are um, lots of differences depending on who's reviewing your paper where that needs to be. So let's take a look here. What slide did you say you were on? I was looking at um, model number four, model fit results. Um, and then uh, let's see. Have no problem. Picture. Yeah, sorry, it's a small print. Uh, there's model two. So okay, so let's let's just go through it. Model two had, let's, let me just walk through the, the examples real quick. Model two had an RMSCA that was 0.048. Uh, actually, let me just back up a little bit. Model 1 had an RMSEA of one, uh, 0.126. So 
So, and I'm going with, um, let's just go down the model fit line here. No, I want to move you up there. Okay, so the model fit, we have these four statistics, or th four or five statistics I put up here. The likelihood ratio test between <coughs> this model and the saturated model. Remember what the saturated model was again? The model where all the variances and covariances were estimated, all the means. That, that likelihood ratio test says this model does not fit as well as the saturated model. So then we start saying, okay, yeah, but that could be problems with that. Let's take a look at RMSEA. RMSEA is 0 0.126. 0 0.126 is where we want RMSEA to be point less than 0 0.05. In fact, Levon even tells you the p-value. <laughs> RMSEA has a distribution to it, so it has to calculate the probability that it's actually less than 0 0.05. So that's sort of your guidepost there. 0 0.126 is pretty bad, although I have seen it published before. So when, uh, Ahmed, you've worked on these before. Have you seen 0.126 in any of the research you've worked in? No. So point... Like 0.08. 0.08, yeah. somewhere around there for that one. Uh, I never see... I rarely see the likelihood ratio test being non-significant. I any, promise anything I do. Maybe you get a 0.08 by in RMSEA. Again, it depends on who's your reviewer, who's your editor for your paper. If you're worried about the truth, I think the more the smaller that gets, the better it is. Someone came up with 0.05. I think it was Hugh and Bentler in a paper in 2002. And I don't believe there is a good theoretical justification for it. But uh, I may be wrong about that. I, I don't, off the top of my head, recall the paper in my own reading of it. The CFI and TLI, you want these to be, someone said, better than 0.95. Oftentimes, uh, I rarely see them better than 0.95, but I usually see them both above 0.9 most frequently. So, so that's where I'm headed. So let's go through kind of my, my process. Model one didn't fit, right? Model two, did you like, by the way, the uh, figuring out where to fix things? That's kind of cool, right? Not all the models in the world do that. But this is one of the nice things about it. And if this whole process that I'm talking about here in path analysis, if you go take the um, latent trait class, you know, measurement models with Lisa next year, same process for most of confirmatory factor analysis as well, structural equation modeling as well. Uh, it's pretty nice. Um, so yeah, we, we changed things. We made model two happen. And now all of a sudden this, this p-value up here for the likelihood ratio test is 0.07. When I, if I were to see that in my actual research, I'd be like, hey, I'm stopping there. It's going to be good. Whenever you typically see the likelihood ratio test with a marginally significant or p-value that's right around 0.05 or higher, usually the other statistics start to look good too. The RMSEA certainly does because these two are yoked together. They're comparing the same types of models. So this is now 0.048. Probably stop there too. Um, and then the other ones, 0.990 and 0.972 for the last two are really close to one. You want those as well. So this, this model, model two here, oops, stop. Model two is where I would stop if I was in practice. Um, the model three and model four are really built to just keep going. I wanted to sort of play with these in front of you a little bit to show what happens when you move this, or what, you, know, you go look at this normalized residual and there's a big number there, bless you. There is, you, you, you know, you do something to address that normalized residual and all of a sudden fit gets better, right? That's sort of what I was trying to go with it here. Does that answer your question? Well, okay. Well, you, you would have like a, in the beginning a theoretical path that you're analyzing. Good, good question. Bang. Um, actually, unfortunately, the way that the, word, the world works these days is you, yes, you know, in theory, you have this theoretical path. It didn't fit. Throw it away. Try a new path. Go collect new data. Test that one out so you're not so capitalizing on chance. We're, we're getting into an exploratory analysis here, yes. And so the reason why that's a problem is it starts to, 
it could potentially capitalize on chance that happens in this data set. And there are some better ways about doing this, I think, um, that could happen. Um, although uh, I tried to implement those once, you know, just recently in a paper, and, and it was met with a lot of um, confusion by the reviewers. I'll just put it that way. Um, one of the things I tried to do was, you heard of the bootstrap method, the bootstrapping your data before I've heard of that? It's basically taking combinations of your data and doing the same analysis on it. So I decided instead of doing just one data set, I would just do the whole path analysis on bootstrap of my data. And, and that did not go well for the reviewers. They really didn't like that. I just think nobody's really looked at it. I think it's more generalizable though. And the interesting thing about the findings, my RMSEA for my data or my CFI for my data were much better for that data set than for almost any of the bootstrap samples that came from it. What does that tell you, right? So yes, it is a problem if you end up doing things that, um, if you start changing your paths, particularly based on p-values or things that are related to chance, it, it could happen. I mean, these normalized residuals, we're effectively using them like hypothesis tests. And so we are opening ourselves up to picking the wrong decision. Certainly. The other aspect that people I've seen do, and this is sort of what we did when we get into, uh, we had this link between mathematics, self-concept, and perceived usefulness. Did you see that? And this is where I could have had, so, to, so when we have a big normalized residual between these two variables, it means we need to do something that connects the two more directly in the model. Right now, there is no direct connection between mathematics, self-concept, and perceived usefulness. I guess math self-efficacy, if you go, if you look at it, it sort of is the link between the two, but it's not doing a good enough job for the model itself. And so I could have, uh, I decided to either add a direct effect, which is sort of predicting perceived usefulness from self-concept, right? or perhaps an indirect effect, which is saying, these two are correlated, I have no idea why. And so the reason well, I chose in this analysis to add the indirect effect, because what it, when, it, when I put an indirect effect in the model between the two, like this, this double-headed arrow, what that does is it says, okay, I know once I go and predict all the stuff in the model, the residuals for these two variables are correlated more than the model thinks they should be. So I can address that directly with this residual covariance. So they're gonna, it's going to perfectly fit them. But it's going to do so in a way that says, I'm not, I don't know why they're correlated, but they are. Right? So in some circumstances, a residual correlation might weaken your argument for the model. But in the path analysis, it rarely does. Because oftentimes, when you look at it from the multivariate regression lens, you know, in multivariate regression, we say, yeah, there's a correlation between the residuals. So what? Right? We're not explaining it. It's just there. So what? So that, that makes, makes it easier to add and say, I'm not going to go really sacrifice anything specifically theoretical about my model. It's sort of an agnostic way of saying, hey, these are correlated in this case. The alternative, though, would have been very different. If I put a direct effect saying, let's say mathematics self-concept predicted perceived usefulness, now it's going to still account for that same amount of variability. It's still going to, you're going to still get a residual covariance that goes away. Because you have a, a, a direct effect there that does the job of that co covariance between the two variables. That you're basically allowing it to be part of a correlation or a, a regression line. But now you're saying there's something very much, much more specific. You're saying math self-concept predicts perceived usefulness. Or if you think about it from the, the causality point of view, which again, I don't like to say in the observational study, but just hypothetically speaking, you're saying this thing causes that thing. That's a lot stronger of a statement than the opposite, which was, yeah, they, they sort of co-vary. I have no idea why. Do you see the difference between those two? And where that difference really shows up, and I think I mentioned it briefly when I was running out of patience with myself talking too much at the end of the, uh, end of the class, when I got into, oh, I don't think I got into it here. Did I show the R square? I thought I showed the R squares for each of these. Gosh, Templin. If you look at the, uh, the R square for that, and the R-square comes out with standardized coefficients for each of the variables at the end of Levon. Yeah, but you did mention the interpretation for your 
Okay, cool. After model six. Okay, that R square that we have for usefulness is 0.043. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I thought I did. Um, 0.043 is where that happens to be. If I would have put the direct effect in, that R square would have been much higher because that direct effect now explains the variability in a different way than the residual covariance does. And that means all of a sudden now we're thinking we're doing more. So that I guess what I'm trying to say is my capitalizing on, I try to do so in a way that's less like really con um, scientifically meaningful. So yeah, you know, then then so, sort of scientifically descriptive. I think there's a big difference between saying A predicts B or A causes B than A and B are correlated, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now there are other cases, by the way, uh, and again, you won't get them in this class, but if you go on to structural equation modeling or a, a measurement class, uh, adding a residual covariance really weakens what your argument is, your validity argument for the latent variable you're trying to measure. So for the same thing can happen, it's like a path diagram. Um, we just have a latent variable in it if we have a confirmatory factor analysis. Let's imagine we have a survey, questionnaire, something like that, and we want to measure some trait, uh, self-determination, let's call it, or something like that. And you can see that there's a big residual covariance between some of one of the pair of the items. If you put a residual covariance between those items, one of the things uh, that happens is now you're saying it's not just residual a, a person's self-determination that causes the pattern of correlation between the items, it's something else as well. Right? And so there are some models out there where that residual covariance will really weaken your argument for the model. Usually the ones where we have latent variables, the observed ones, it tends to just be like, oh, I guess that's okay. Ahmed. Bless you. Yes, that's right. The resi well, the residual covariance between items. That's right. So if you have a pair of items in a confirmatory factor analysis, and there's a residual covariance that's large between them, and then you add a residual covariance parameter for those pairs of items, what you've done then is to say it's no longer that trait you're trying to measure that's causing all of the, the, covariant, the patterns of correlation in the items. It's now something that you can't explain in addition to the trait. And, why, and that's a big step. It's no longer just self-determination, for instance, in my example. It's self-determination and something else that I don't know what it is. Right? That really weakens what you're trying to say about that analysis. But when it comes to observed variables that we believe are truly observed, although this example is bad with that, these, none of these are observed with the exception of um, perhaps college credit hours, high school credit hours, and sex, um, the, uh, the observed variables, for whatever reason, well, for, for good reason, don't have that same criteria. It doesn't weaken the model as much when you add the residual covariance. Nuanced. Is everybody tired of this class? I'm looking at you all thinking, you're tired now, right? It's a lot, right? It's just complicated stuff. It really is. Yeah, Ryan. Let's do homework. Actually, before I get there, Last chance, questions about lecture concepts? Oh, I guess we wouldn't say last class chance. But I know that homework is going to take us, we're going to go a while with homework. All right, I'll pause the lecture questions. Not last chance, there's no last chance for pretty much anything. Uh, except for the NCAA tournament, I guess. <laughs> what a juggernaut. Anyway. Uh, Yes. Where would you like to start, Ryan? I just started doing it, um, but I'm trying to do the, um, the saturated model. Okay. And um, in our lectures, we never really did covariances with groups. You know what I mean? Like, you have like one is an in-trait group and one is a trait group. Like, you need to put them in the like, how do you Okay. Let me, uh, let me do this. Let me go back to the lecture that is the closest parallel. And, and see if we can draw the distinction. Does that sound cool, everybody? Multivariate linear models. That was, uh, oh, it's just last week. We all had hope. Sorry, this basketball thing's taking me, taking me pretty down dark places. Um, I wouldn't say that, actually. 
I thought it was pretty cool we got to go to the Final Four. I didn't ever expect to be there. It certainly didn't ruin my weekend to see them lose. I sort of, you know, let it happen. So. Right, this is syntax from the multivariate linear models lecture. Intro uh, so yeah, uh, sorry, it's introduction. Yes, introduction to multivariate linear models. Actually, this would be this would be multi multivariate linear models with predictors. Let me go there. That's really where we need to go. Pardon me. Okay. So our multivariate linear model with predictors. I'm so tired of talking about perf. <laughs> perf. Now we had two predict. We had two outcomes: performance and usefulness. And we needed to predict it with uh, female, uh, college credit hours, and the interaction of the two. And in this analysis, let me uh, let me do this. Oh yeah, that's a good window sound there. <laughs> Sorry. This gets all quiet. We need something to break up the monotony here. All right, load simplot. There you go. Okay, so in this analysis, we have performance, we have usefulness. Are those are the two outcomes. Can you see this okay? Is this visible? Um, we have a grouping variable named female. We have a continuous variable named CC10, and we have the interaction between the two of those variables. This is starting to seem familiar. So now, we want to build an empty model in this crazy Levon world to be able to enable us to do the simultaneous test of adding more than one regression weight to a model, right, to be able to compare the likelihood ratio test between the model with variables in versus the model that doesn't have it. Uh, we need to put in each of the models with a zero and each of the variables, each of the predictors with a zero in front of them. It's a little weird. It's like saying, it, I know, uh, hold that thought, there's going to be variables here in the future. Right? Does that seem a little weird to you? Let me see if I can tie this more to homework too. So let's compare her. In this homework assignment, you have two outcomes. You have the rating for a person, the average rating for persons who had um, when they made crepes, and the average rating for a person when they made pancakes. Does that seem familiar? Okay, cool. Cool. And. We need, an we need model number one, which is an empty model with an unstructured covariance matrix. So that's, I can see your question. The covariance matrix, really the covariance matrix in this case is going to be unstructured for, um, it, it's what we talk about with the, the dependent variables, the outcomes. The covariance matrix for the endogenous variables, the predict, or sorry, the exogenous variables, the predictors is already going to be done by default for Levon. So really all we need to specify is the covariance, or is sort of the spots for the, the outcome variables. So if I go back to the R syntax just for this other example, I have two outcome variables, so performance and usefulness. So my Levon syntax is going to have a, a section under means here, and this would be like crepe ratings, and this would be like pancake ratings. Each followed by a tilde. And then you'd have, you don't necessarily have to put the one there, but you know, just copy and paste my syntax and change the variables is where I'm going with this. Um, a one represents the intercept for each of these regression lines. Uh, a, this zero in front multiplying female says, let's pretend that female was a predictor, but we're going to fix the regression coefficient equal to zero. And so we get all three, we do the same thing for CC10 and female by CC10. And so those predictors are going to be 
what you have in the data already in that you have your two outcomes here, pancake rating and crepe rating. Crepe class, which should have been one of the predictors, right? The crepes were the, what did I say was the, actually, hold on, what was the, um, crepe, uh, so yeah, crepe class, pancakes instruction is the reference group. They're already dummy coded for you. Experience is your continuous predictor. And then this last column is literally column E times column F. I don't know why I put pancake class in there. I probably should have taken it out. But that ignore column D. That doesn't do anything for you. So if you go, you see there's a bunch of zeros in experience by crepe class until you get down to anybody who's in the crepe class. And then you get one times whatever's over of experience being in that column as well. Right? So let me show you what happens with this other example, though. This other example, I, cre I, had to, I had to create all the variables by hand. I, was, I did that all for you, trying to be nice. As nice as I can by challenging you with a homework that seems challenging. Is it challenging, should I say? Dare I say challenging? Um, realistically, once you get into this, though, I hope what you're going to say is, oh, that's, I've got two regression lines now instead of one. Right? But once we get getting to that part's the challenge. But when I do this analysis, here's what you get from your uh, results. You see a bunch of zeros for your regression parameters. And you'll see a covariance between performance and usefulness. You'll see variances between, in this case, I guess covariance between pancakes and crepes. The variances between, for pancakes and variance for crepes. But you don't see the other part. You don't see the exogenous variables. Even though they have to be there, because the way that Levon works, this model isn't saturated. There's six extra degrees of freedom somewhere. And those degree, degrees of freedom come from estimating three variances and three covariances, all for the exogenous variables. Yeah? Just crepe class. If you put... What will happen to your analysis if you put pancake class and crepe class in at the same model? It'll blow up. That's a good one. It is. Do you know why it will blow up? Watch this. What happens if I sum pancake and crepe together? It's always one. And guess what? That column of ones is replicated by your intercept in your analysis. So you have two columns of ones in your analysis, which are the quintessential definition of collinearity or multicollinearity. Right? So you can't put them both in and have an intercept there. I won't talk about it yet if you want. Don't don't, don't let's not let's not imagine what happens if you got rid of the intercept, because that's also a possibility, but keep that quiet for right now. It's overwhelming enough. Okay, where do you want? Do you want me to start walking you through some of the steps to get started? Yes. The answer is three. <laughs> let me just tell you the answers. Yeah. Okay. What's that? We're at that point of the semester. Yeah. I know the feeling. Believe me. I'm seriously debating, like, every time I do a homework for you guys, I'm like, do I really want to give you this? And mainly because, do I really want to ask questions about this? No. All right, let's talk about how to get started. First thing, open our studio from scratch, just wherever you have it. Just say, let me just close out of it. Actually, first thing, first thing should be download your data. Make note of where that is. Step two, click on the starter syntax, copy everything, and now open RStudio with a blank file in RStudio, so you can, oops. I really wanted to get rid of that one. So you, you, if you just go up to this plus button over here and just click it, it creates a brand new, select R script, paste the stuff from the web page into that file, figure out the numbers, where the numbers are, and change that with your ID number. 
422 temp. There you go. And then save that file where you save the data. I put my data in downloads. I'm going to save that file to downloads too. If you don't have a Mac, there's a downloads folder on Windows you'll be able to find. If you're using a Linux, you probably know more than I do about computing. <laughs> Probably don't have to have that discussion, right? Am I right? Anyone else? Anyone use Linux in here? Yeah. Yeah. Begrudgingly. Um, actually, Linux is pretty good. So now, once you've done that, close our studio. Don't save anything. Get out of our studio. Go to the folder where you saved your file. Again, I'm in downloads. Double click on the R Studio file to open it. And now it will should be, be able to read in your data okay. You get that far? You with me? Awesome. Okay. Question? Uh, run the line that says, if you run all the lines that say, that are up here in this, the script, it, it'll install it for you. The install packages line should have done that. And if not, just take that line 16 or whatever it is on yours. Install packages Levon and rerun that. May take may take a little bit of time. Okay. So to do things in Levon, let's just take a look at our data real quick. I'm gonna just go over to the environment and grab this is my data, right? Mainly I just want to see the names of the variables. Because you'll need to know those in Levon to make it work. Okay? So the other way I could do that is just this names data 01. There are, my, there are all my variables right there. Hello. Great. Let's start with model 0. Is it model 0 I'm calling it? Model 1? I don't remember what it's called. It's that part of the semester. Empty model. Model 1. Mo oh. Model 01. Or just model 1 dot syntax. I'm calling it model 1 dot syntax because Levon works by having to create this character based syntax file. Right? Now the characters, I say model 01 syntax equals, and then I, if, I hit a, if I hit the double quote, it puts two of them there. Immediately go and hit return, four or five lines. Because now everything that you type in here will turn green, which means it's part of that character quote, the character string. Right? Everybody. Am I going too quick? <laughs> because uh, the people who create our packages can do so in any which way they choose, and they all choose it differently to drive me nuts and try to teach it. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, it's, it's mainly because Levon um, requires you to have it all in quotes. And the reality of it is a lot of the, there are a number of packages that do it this way, and typically those are the ones that have more than one dependent variable involved in them. You're going to see um, in the slides that I have in the online lecture I just put up uh, for today or for next week that's already up there, you're going to see what it looks like to try to do it the old way. And we have to create extra dummy coded variables. First of all, we have to stack our data. Do you remember stacking our data from the first homework assignment where we had, oh God, make friends with R and everybody wanted to quit then? By the way, thank you for not quitting. I believe in you. Um, so it gets much, uh, if, if you think, um, th this will actually, once you get used to it, be a lot more direct. Um, it's just right now, it's a little bit different than what you've seen before. And actually, I'm debating just thinking if I get rid of the whole mixed model part altogether, if I could just do everything in this way. And we just start, start with regression this way, rather than have to change over and over again. It's one of the changes I'm thinking about for the next time, but we'll see. So does everybody have this? Other questions? I, I'd be willing to say that if you want some help, Jihong, are you able to walk around if anybody has help and wants to, you know, uh, request assistance? Just Jihong, uh, thank you for your help. I always want to thank you. I can't imagine giving this class without you. Right? <laughs> so, so I think that's truly, uh, truly the name of a teaching assistant. Actually, uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's probably a stronger word than assistant for that, right? So, okay. 
Next, what do we put in the quotes? Let's start with our dependent variables. Always start there. What are our, our DVs for this model? Pancake rating and crepe rating. Now they have to be spelled the same way in your syntax file, in the syntax quote right here, that they are in your data file. So I'm, you see how I ran this names data 01 and I can see the names of all the variables below? I'm just going to copy pancake rating and paste it in the syntax area. I'm going to copy crepe rating and paste it in the syntax area on a different line. And before, in that other model that I talked about, when we had, um, when we looked at this syntax right here from the example, I had a section called means. I'll just call this means just to make it fun. Bless you. Okay. So this is the model for the means, right? This is the part of the, de the deal that we do the prediction with. How are we doing? Now, each of these, for each line, for each row of this, this output right here, functions just like the syntax we had in LM, meaning dependent variable tilde, and then what you want to predict it by. But in this case, we have to know all the variables we need to predict it by to make it run, right? So tilde, we know there's an intercept there. I'm just going to put a one there just because I can. What are the variable? I can put another tilde here for crate rating and a one. And actually, believe it or not, if that's all you did right now, I can go to the Levon function itself the SEM function and actually analyze these data. Data equals, bless you, data 01. Here I want to do mimic equals quote M plus and estimator equals quote MLR. Those are the options I believe I asked you to put on based on the homework here. Right here, yes, mimic equals M plus estimator equals MLR. Let me show you what happens when I do all of that. Well, model 01 fit. I need model 01 syntax. Model 01 syntax, right here. When I do all of this, it runs. And then I can do summary, model 1.fit. And but here, this is where I need the summary statement for Levon has a lot of other things we usually tack into it, such as standardize equals true and fit measures equals true. If I do that, you're going to see we have, we have results already for our analysis. You see where this is going? Just trying to get you familiar with Levon a little bit here. All right, so you, yeah. So you don't have to put Well, I would say, yeah, you do, and here's why. In this output, you see intercepts and you see variances. But missing from this is the covariance between the two variables. And so to make sure that that covariance needs to be there, you'll need at least some type of placeholder for that. And so that's where I usually get in the habit of just putting everything in the analysis itself. So does everybody see what I did there? OK, let me start, just re 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 recap. I created model 01 syntax as a variable name. And at the end of the, after the equal sign, I just hit the double quote, which put two in. I made some space in between the beginning and the end of the double quote. And I just put text in. And I started by finding the names of the dependent variables. And I just envisioned those were the parts of the model in the LM statement when I was doing my code from before, right? My, my linear model. So I just put a tilde afterwards. And I put one there. That just means estimate an intercept. Truly empty. But basically, that's what it, Levon needs to get started. It needs, I need, Levon needs to know what are your dependent variables. The way you tell Levon that is by putting them in the analysis and putting a tilde one afterwards. And from there, that, so that's our, sort of a common starting point. Does that work? 
Um, the next step from this then is to think about when we get this output, several things. We look here, we've got intercepts, we have variances, but we know the, the saturated model that I'm asking for in the analysis needs a covariance between those variables. So we need to go add that to the syntax. Shall we do that? Here we go. Let's go add everything else too. The covariance, the way you do that is you take one of the dependent variables, and here's the funny part of Levon, it's not just one tilde, you put two tildes there. <laughs> what? Two tildes. And you put the other one on the other side of the two tildes. Doesn't matter which one you put first or second because the covariance of x with y is equal to the covariance of y with x. You see what I did? Cool. Now I don't need it, but I'm going to add it anyway. Variances work in the same way. So for each variable, we can put it, we can put delta tilde, and we can put the variable again. Ryan. So we do not need to do the regression equation. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> We're getting there. We're building. For model one, it's needed. Yep, that was the, uh, the first mistake I made in actually checking the homework last week. But yeah, it needs to be there because to do a likelihood ratio test, the likelihood ratio test has to have the same variables and the same people in the analysis. And without the, because Levon puts the exogenous variables into the likelihood, the covariance matrix is five by five in the, in the alternative model. We need to have that same size of it in, the, in the, uh, the null model. So that's why we have to put them in with zeros. It's frustrating. It's not how I would do it if I were programming it. I guess I could program it myself, but you know. It's R, it's open source, but I got, I got bigger things at the moment, like sleep. <coughs> All right. So does everybody see what I did here? I have means now. I have the covariance between the two, and I have variances. The variances probably aren't needed, but let's just run this analysis now, see if it works. Hooray, I've got numbers. What you should see now is the following. Zero degrees of freedom should be up under the robust likelihood. That's because with two variables in the model, our covariance matrix has, has been saturated. We have a mean, we have a variance a co, uh, for each variable. We have a covariance for each variable. We have a mean for each variable. We've got all the parameters. They're all done. So when you see zero degrees of freedom here, it means you're fitting a model that's equivalent to the saturated model because when you do the likelihood ratio test, degrees of freedom comes from number the difference in parameters. Yeah, it's perfect fit. It's where you want it. Uh, it's, it means you don't have to worry about model fit anymore. And when you look down at the bottom now, you do see a covariance as part of the output as well. Right? So we're almost there. Questions on this? Yeah. Mm. If you don't see model fit, under the summary statement is going to be the problem. To see the model fit show up in summary, you have to put this fit.measures equals true into your summary statement as an argument. So summary is a function that's called it's a, called a generic function. It means that you can you can sort of, as a, as an, when you build an R package, you can make your own version of summary. And so when you make your own version of it, sometimes you put different arguments into it. And Levon decided that it wanted to allow fit measures there. You didn't see fit measures in our LM statement. That's because the summary that goes with LM doesn't need it. Yeah. Ah, okay. So in that case, make sure it's model one dot syntax that shows up in the SEM bracket here or you have and you have model one fit right here okay so something wrong ran, ran ran wrongly with your your model so I'll have you summon Jihong our uh, I need a better word for him than assistant does anyone have a wizard, wizard. that's awesome <laughs> stats wizard I like it let's do that is that good enough who suggested that all right. 
<laughs> I dig it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, hey, folks, I know this is now when we normally take a break. If you'd like to take a break, should we take a break now and just think this over and then come back and we'll walk through the rest of the steps in the, the, to get started? Okay. How about 10 minutes? Come back about 35 after. If you want to ask me questions, just queue up over here and I'll, uh, I'll, talk, I'll talk to you right now. I'm going to stop the stream and we'll come back in 10 minutes. <laughs>